webinar. So thanks everybody for being here. My name is Sarah. I am a program manager here at North House. If you don't know North House, we are a folk school on the North Shore of Lake Superior in Grand Marais, Minnesota. And uh, like I said, we are in the middle of Wood Week here on campus. And Wood Week is a week-long celebration of all things woodworking. And we've had a bunch of different wood-related classes on campus. And today we're taking a break from classes before we start another three days uh, for the weekend. And today is what we call the Carvers Conference. And there's a bunch of wonderful demos that have been going on. And um, the webinar watch parties are part of that too, as well as a future uh, presentation by I guess instructor, Mary May, who has come into town from South Carolina. So we're having a lot of fun on campus on these beautiful days and just really um, enjoying seeing, seeing folks' faces, but we know not everybody can get here. So we're really thankful that we can do these webinars and welcome a greater community from all over so you can participate um, wherever you are. And I just wanna quick say, um, in addition to this uh, webinar tonight, we will have uh, another webinar on March 25th with Magnus Sundelin from Sweden. And he'll be talking about um, his work with uh, green woodworking and how, how he got into um, working with wood and making tools. And that will be a wonderful time. So that um, registration link is on the North House website, northhouse.org. And we've got a bunch of links to Wood Week and those webinar presentations uh, right on the homepage. So pretty easy to find. So um, just really quickly before, uh, we uh, move into our presentation. I just wanted to give everybody a quick uh, Zoom tour here. It's really helpful if you have a question to type that in the Q&A instead of the chat. It's um, sometimes the questions get lost in the in the chat function. So if you have a comment and you or you just want to say um, something like awesome or cool in support of whatever our present presenter is saying, feel free to write that in the chat. We're happy to hear about things you wanna, wanna share. But if you have a question you would like answered, definitely uh, use the Q&A function. It uh, looks like two little chat bubbles together and should be at the bottom of your screen. And that way we can see your question really easily and get that, get that answered. So um, I now wanna, uh, introduce Jared Dahl, who is going to be our presentation host for the evening and will um, share uh, our presenters uh, welcome. So Jared, thanks for being here. Jared uh, has instructed um, many classes with North House over the year and is a green board woodworker himself. And um, I know Jared, you're, you're in the starting up the folk school yourself and feel free to say anything you want about how that's going but I will go ahead and uh, hand the mic off to you and I will let you uh, welcome our our featured presenter tonight so thank you so much thanks Sarah um, uh, good uh, good evening or hello everyone um, as uh, Sarah mentioned I'm I'm uh, one of the lead instructors, or maybe you didn't mention it, but one of the lead instructors of the school and not just an instructor, um, they ask us to participate and help kind of organize various events. Of course, Wood Week is one of those. And um, I was searching for folks that would be of interest to the North House community. And uh, Jeff Bierce, uh, um, the woodworker and friend that I've, I've known for a few years now, um, you know, came right to the top of my list. Um, it's a subject matter that <clears throat> isn't necessarily um, been focused too much at North House. Um, so, you know, in a way of broadening our, our, our view or scope of things, um, I, think, I think it would be, would be of great interest. Um, so Jeff, Jeff kindly agreed to give us a presentation and um, you know, he's from the Bay Area. I met him a few years ago. Uh, and I think the main was when you were traveling to Japan, you were posting on Instagram a little bit. That's when I first started following along. And, and then later through a mutual friend, Greg Reeb, and the Bay Area scene there, which you'll get into, I'm sure, 
um, we got to know each other a little bit. So um, I'll leave it at that. And again, use the Q and A feature. I'll, I'll I'll be monitoring that through the presentation, and we'll, we'll see what we can do um, with that. So cool. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jeff, for for taking the time. And uh, oh, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, I, I was recalling back when we did meet and we had some uh, some freshly made soba at Soba Uchi, uh, a little Japanese restaurant near my shop. And that was fantastic. Uh, but yeah, thanks everyone for being here and thank you North House for the invitation and, and for the support for helping me figure out uh, what we're doing today in terms of slides and all of that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's really neat to see where everyone is coming from. And I saw Ventura on there. So shout out to Ventura. Uh, I used to live in Ojai. And uh, if you're in Ventura, I, I won't say your name, but uh, because I closed the chat, but you might know one of my first teachers down there, um, David Shiposh, who does Japanese work. He's in, he's in Ventura and his shop's in Ojai. So anyway, good to see someone from down there and see people from everywhere else too. Um, yeah, so this is a topic that I love and I'm excited about. And I thought I would give you a little bit of an intro to how I got into it. Uh, and then talk a bit about the San Francisco Bay Area Japanese woodworking scene and, and the rich history we have here with Japanese woodworking, Japanese carpentry. And I'll be using those terms interchangeably for today. Um, and then I want to talk more about um, what I was calling the spirit of Japanese carpentry. It struck me as a little pretentious when I... <laughs> when I read it back to myself later, but um, it's uh, sort of the heart of Japanese carpentry would be another way to say it. Um, so I've, I've been doing this stuff for about 22 years. Um, I had a background in, in philosophy and religious studies and through a weird chain of events, ended up doing some teaching at, at Art Center in Pasadena in their graduate industrial design program. And one of the things I loved about that was that the teach I was teaching philosophy of design, philosophy and ethics of design and making, um, but I was involved with uh, the students in their studio. It was a very hands-on um, industrial design program, which was very cool. And one of the things I noticed there in their shop space was uh, Japanese pole saws. And that sort of piqued my interest. I had a little bit of woodworking experience at that time, uh, building a boat for someone in Santa Barbara who was retiring and was gonna sail around the world. Um, so I got to help with that. And uh, there was some woodworking in my family. My, my, grandfather taught carpentry at a trade school in Cape Cod. Uh, so I, I had some background in woodworking, but I was really pursuing academic matters. And, and I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, I moved to Berkeley to do a PhD in religious studies and philosophy, especially in, in um, religious aesthetics and um, needed the job because it's so expensive even then, 22 years ago, to live in the Bay Area. And I had a friend who worked at uh, Joinery Structures. Joinery Structures is in Oakland and um, it's one of the principal or, or main and, and largest builders of Japanese style structures in the US. And outside of Japan, it's probably the biggest. Uh, so I had this acquaintance who worked there and he was a woodworker. Um, he got me a job basically in spite of my lack of experience. The, the, the principal at Joinery Structures is a guy named Paul Disco, although he's not, uh, he has pulled away and is mostly retired. So he's not at Joinery anymore, but Paul's a, a Zen priest 
And um, I remember in the interview, he asked a little bit about my woodworking experience, but he was more interested in, <laughs> in my, my religious studies and, and philosophy background. And um, he saw that I had an interest and he, he just said, oh, well, we, we have to hire you, you know, because of your uh, religious studies interest and, and background and you'll, you'll learn as you go. And so I sort of entered a, an informal apprenticeship, you might say, nothing like apprenticeship in Japan, <laughs> uh, which is much different. But <clears throat> um, at that time, Joinery Structures was working on a huge project. I'll show you a few pictures in a few minutes. And they had probably 30 carpenters, um, 30 woodworkers, and a, a really large shop space. And they were building out a massive um, estate down in Woodside, California, which ended up having, at the end of the day, about 15 Japanese structures in, in a 16th, 17th century style uh, with a pond and bridges and just an amazing place. And so when I stepped foot on that property <laughs> for the first time, I didn't really know what to expect. I hadn't really seen pictures. Um, and I was simply bowled over, you know. Um, the amount of intention and care and the amazing architectural style just, it really captured me. So um, that project went on for a few years in terms of my involvement and then and then it wrapped up and it, it, in total, I think the project was probably a 10 year deal. Uh, my involvement was about two years, but that's how I cut my teeth. Um, I had no tools the first day I showed up. I quickly met a bunch of very generous craftspeople who helped me and showed me what to buy and how to set it up and, um, and quickly just got to work. Uh, and eventually, <laughs> for a number of reasons, I dropped the academic pursuits and, and just focused on this stuff. That's, that's how much I loved it. Um, so I mentioned Paul Disco, uh, the principal at Joinery Structures, which, which brings up the, the history of Japanese carpentry and woodworking in the Bay Area. So, you know, outside of Japan, it's really, I can't think of another place that has anywhere near the number of craftspeople working in the Japanese tradition or the number of buildings and structures, both public and private, which are built in, in a Japanese style that's quite authentic. Um, we there are so many of them in terms of those buildings and structures here. Uh, I learn about new ones every year, uh, and I and I'm a person who pays attention to it. So they're they're tucked away. There some of them are hidden, but they're around. Some of them are not so hidden, and we'll look at some photos in a bit of some of the the public structures. But this tradition goes back at least to the early 20th century when there was the Pan Pacific exhibition in Golden Gate Park, uh, which brought over a bunch of craftspeople from Japan, carpenters, daiku, and they put up a bunch of um, structures, including a, a, a pagoda, which is still extant, um, and it's being actually worked on right now, kind of um, renovated, and some of those carpenters from that exposition then went on and were hired by people who saw their work at the exposition to do uh, structures, pavilions, houses, etc., around the Bay Area. And so some of those people stayed on and continued working. And so again, that, that begins, I think the Pan Pacific Exposition was 1915. Um, there was a bit of a hiatus, although there was plenty of garden work going on um, after that. 
But until roughly the 60s, there weren't a lot of Japanese structures being put up. The focus was more on gardens. Those two things always go together, but um, it was mostly the, the garden development that was, that was happening until about the late 60s, early 70s. Um, so Paul Disco and a few other people, a guy named Lenny Brackett at Eastwind, um, they ended up going to Japan and apprenticing. Now, Paul, as I mentioned, was his is his end priest. And at that time, I don't think he was ordained yet. I'm not sure, but he was sent to Japan by his teacher, who is um, Suzuki Roshi. Here's a picture of Suzuki Roshi. Uh, some of you might know this book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. So Suzuki is widely credited with having brought really brought Zen Buddhism to America in a, in a practical way. He was involved with the San Francisco Zen Center, which has three properties, one in San Francisco, one called Green Gulch in Marin, and another called Tassajara down in near Big Sur. It's not in Big Sur, but near Big Sur. And those are, uh, you know, they have Zendos and people are practicing Zen meditation at those places and also growing food and um, that kind of thing. And so Suzuki Roshi sent Paul to Japan to study carpentry uh, and to study Japanese architecture so that he could come back and build the buildings they needed at these properties that I mentioned. And so he did that along the way. He was roommates with the other guy I mentioned, Lenny Brackett. They spent, I want to say five, but it may have been seven years in Kyoto studying six days a week, probably sharpening all their tools on Sunday, uh, probably living very intense, simple lives, just trying to keep up uh, with the carpenters there and, and trying to learn. And they came back and to California, to the Bay Area. Lenny, Lenny went inland a little bit up to near Lake Tahoe. They also sort of brought back in their, in their train uh, a guy named Makoto Imai. Um, and those three guys are sort of, there's others, and I'll, I'll mention them, but they're sort of the major lights, you might say in Japanese woodworking in the Bay Area and outside of Japan. Um, they've had a lot of influence. They've built a lot of buildings. They've had many, many students. Uh, and Makoto has had students who went through full-on traditional apprenticeship with him. And so um, those are the main dudes. Um, there are a few others. There are also, I'm happy to say, especially in the kind of second or third generation, there are, there are a good number of women too, which is nice and important. Um, a few other influences on San Francisco Japanese woodworking, uh, Hida Tool. Some of you may know of Hida Tool from online or maybe in person. It's located in Berkeley started by the people around those three principal people that I mentioned. And Hida Tool started importing high quality Japanese tools from Japan and turning people onto that stuff. One other influence on Japanese woodworking outside of Japan or, or you know, here in the US, uh, Whole Earth Catalog, which some of you will know of. Uh, Jared, I, I bet you're familiar. Um, people, people in woodworking and in the sort of DIY craft world know about Whole Earth Catalog. Whole Earth Catalog was, was selling pull saws and chisels and a few Japanese um, machines a long, long time ago in the 70s. And uh, they were located here in Berkeley as well. So those are the main influences uh, and sort of the streams that fed into this 
pretty strong current of Japanese woodworking here in the Bay Area. And, and now this certainly has grown beyond the Bay Area. Ma Makoto Imai is up in Seattle and one of his students, Dale Brotherton, who's a major guy, an amazing person and craftsperson. Um, we have people on the East Coast, a few people in the Midwest, um, and it continues to grow. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so maybe if anyone has any questions, we could take a question or two, but if not, I'll show a couple slides and um, you can see some of the work and some of the tools and stuff. Yeah, uh, we, we can wait around for a little bit. The Makoto, he, he uh, is he up in Seabeck, Washington? You know, the last, so I saw Dale Brother 10 a few weeks ago and he thought that Makoto was living near Bainbridge Island. Okay. okay. And, and I don't know the town you mentioned. So, uh -huh. yeah. It might be <clears throat> just an odd story. My folks live out there and I was looking for work um, years ago. And my dad's like, let's go. There's this Japanese timber framer guy we could go visit. And I was oh. at his, his, some of his workshops. He wasn't around. We were just going to cold call and show up. But uh, mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder if he was there, what my, path would have been you know right right yeah yeah that that may have been him um especially if if your dad meant like a literally japanese yeah 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 yeah, yeah that was probably him yeah yeah I i'm pretty sure it is but uh yeah you know, so uh, name of the company that's hida tool hida h-i-d-a yeah. and they're still going um under new under new owners or new to, they're, you know, 10, 12 years old now, having bought the place. Uh, Osamu was the former owner. And he's got some connection, family connection to Makoto. I'm not sure what it is. Someone else is asking about um, the transition from uh, academia to craft work, you know, uh, how do you feel both could exist in you for you simultaneously, or do you feel they could be simultaneous? I do, I do. Uh, that's thank you for that question. Um, uh, exactly, which plays what role and who gets the upper hand? It's a little bit of a battle um, <laughs> because each of them demands kind of total submission. So I'm kind of falling between two stools, you know. Um, uh, I'm probably not ever going to be very good at either. Is the, <laughs> is the upshot? But I, I try, and yeah, I'm working on. I've had some writing projects going, which are more academic, uh, looking at the philosophy of making, and uh, as that plays out in the West, especially, but with Japan as a kind of counterpoint. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep them together, doing my best. Yeah, that's cool. Um, <clears throat> we have another question about how to recognize Japanese carpentry, and I'm sure that your photos are going to answer that question. So, yeah, and that, good, that, maybe a good segue to the. That's a perfect segue, and that, uh, identifying Japanese carpentry or woodworking uh, is the next topic. So, um, let's let's get into that and. Um, and I think it's a good idea, Jared, to, yeah, let's start with some slides and bear with me for two seconds while things get weird. Uh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. So, And Jared, what was the next? Hit play. Just hit play. Right. You, you, your cursor is hovering. Nope, nope. Well, maybe that'll work. That there one. it is. Yeah, yeah. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, great. Yeah. So sorry about these first couple of pictures. They're a little grainy. Um, this. So this is the 
the massive project that I mentioned earlier uh, that I was where, where I got my start. And this is down in Woodside, California, a lot of tech people down there. And um, this is the large estate with a, this is just the small part of, this is the koi part of the pond. And then there's another part of the pond with waterfalls. It's, it's, it's nuts. Um, there's a little boat made by um, uh, Brooks. What's his name? Sorry. Douglas, Douglas Brooks. Thank you by Douglas Brooks that floats around on here and all kinds of cool stuff. But this, this, um, this gable here, and then and the switch it up these gables here this is this is where i started learning to do this stuff i was i had one japanese plane very small a couple chisels and i was planing those shingles you see there and um on these on the edges of these gables these shingles curve in. And so, whereas these are all squared off here, if you could see these on the gable ends, which you can't really, you'd see that they're shaped and they, they pull in and tighten in in a curve from about this part of the gable all the way up to here, increasingly progressively curving inward. And so we're shaping all that stuff by hand, each shingle. That's a good way to learn how to sharpen a plane is just do a million shingles, <laughs> you know? So it was good, good training. Um, anyway, this is the main residence. There's this walkway, here's the larger pond. And here's one interior shot, which is pretty nice. You can see all this log work up here. In Japan, in most homes in Japan, traditionally the log work would be hidden below a drop ceiling. But someone noticed at some point how cool it is. And um, we, we like to show it off, so. Um, this is the south wing of main residence where a lot of kind of entertaining takes place. And so this is a, this is a pretty large room. You may not be able to tell just from this photo, but, um, and this is a hand, like hand hewn granite water basin that goes outside the building. A lot of cool features here. Um, and so Japanese carpentry, Japanese woodworking, you know, so many different types, obviously. What you do, Jared, with Urushi and bowls and turning in the Japanese style to timber frames like this. Um, in, a, in Japan, most carpenters are focused on either building timber frame homes or timber frame temples, or they're building furniture, or they're building shoji screens and sliding doors. There is a bit more division of labor there because there's more demand. In, in the US, a lot of us working in this tradition tend to do a lot of different things. So from timber frames like this to maybe tonsu. Um, but, but the main portion of the work is structures. Um, gates, bell towers, timber frames like this. Um, here's, so, so that's part of that big project that was going on for 10 years. Some of my own stuff that I've done recently, this is a little, this is us putting up the timber frame of a little tea house, uh, also in Woodside. Uh, all, this was a basically a Paul Disco design that he handed off to me and let me mess with a bit. Um, here, so here's the timber frame with a, with a- 
clay uh, stucco on those gables? Is it stucco? Or this, this stucco? So here, what you're looking at there is some, some marine ply and that will get um, traditional Japanese plaster over it. I see, I see. Yeah. And we needed a very thin wall right there. And so we just did ply. Um, this is when all was said and done. And maybe I can. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. So this is that curved member that you saw back here. And here's a little bit of that plaster right there. And so this is a traditional Japanese. Well, it's not traditional because it's not made with the clay from the site and all that, which is an amazing process. This stuff you can buy in bags um, and mix it up and put it on. Tatami mats, shoji screens. This is called a kotatsu. You can sit and put your feet in there as you've probably done in some Japanese restaurants. Um, a view from the side here. Here's that kotatsu. This is the tokonoma, which is a display alcove. And just, you can see a little more detail there. Th this here is a rain door and there's three of those and they protect the shoji screens from weather. And when they're not in use, they can actually slide over here to the left and go into a little shed that's right here. So that's a little tea house we did. Um, the next slide is of a, a temple project. And this was done inside a Western style building, um, which is not completely unusual, even in Japan. Um, this is a Tenrikyo temple, which is a relatively new religion in Japan. And when it came on the scene, it had to come under the wing of Shinto, so it wouldn't be outlawed. In any case, it borrows a lot of its style from Shinto temples and, and also Zen temples. Um, get a little closer here. So this is a typical Zen temple railing and stair setup big massive timbers, these are just solid timbers. Um, this curved rail with a round rail, flat, chunky square. These are called giboshi. Um, bra little bracket system here, et cetera. What uh, species of wood uh, generally do you use in California or um or in this project, someone asked a question and I know that's a, it's a broad subject, but. Uh... Oh, no, that's a great subject. For, for a lot of these structures, we, we use the most desirable wood outside of Japan for Japanese work is Port Orford cedar. Alaskan yellow cedar is also used a lot. And for more structural members like headers and stuff, we end up using a lot of Douglas fir tight old growth stuff if we can get it, you know. Um, but the Port Orford cedar is closest in quality uh, to uh, Hinoki and Hiba, which are this really prized species in Japan. A um, little more of this rail. This is pretty small. Um, if I stood here, I, my head would be out of frame easily. This round post here is nine inches six and a sixteenth. <clears throat> so this is a chunky member here. This is about five and some change, this post. But these are short little rails. Uh, and I, I'm in love with these rails, by the way, um, this, this style. And I have a million pictures from Japan of those rails. Um, Where did you say that this, this temple was? This is also in Woodside. Huh? Um, a lot of work in Woodside that we've done. So moving on just to some joinery 
nerd out stuff. Um, there's a uh, Shippasumi Kanawatsugi scarf joint. And there are some headers in this temple project, which are done this way. And those headers are oriented so that if you turn this 90 degrees, that's how they hang. Not like this. And there, you can see kind of right here, there's a notch. And on the corresponding member, which you can't see, there's a tenon. And so when you flip that 90 degrees, it's, it, they're not going to come apart like this. They're just stuck. And it's an extremely strong joint. Um, when it's closed up, it looks like that. And here's a, a peg, which pushes the pieces into each other. It's not a, a draw peg, it's like a push peg. Um, here's a little bit of joinery on those big nine inch round posts before they were made round. So we cut most of the joinery beforehand because it's easier to lay it out <laughs> when things are square. And we cut it keeping in mind what's gonna happen when all, this whole corner gets rounded off, for instance. And let's see here, I'm gonna to skip to the couple of the planes we use for that rounding process. These are custom made for the size post that we were um, told to produce by the temple carpenter. And we, we got two of these from Japan, uh, from Suzuki A, tool dealer. And here's another shot. Uh, this is creating the sharpening stone that will accept this blade, right? To sharpen this curved bottom blade or cur curved edge blade, I mean. And then here's a little further along in the process. This is Walter Harzog, an amazing craftsman. And we both, we picked, we both had one of these to do. And um, you can see this post here has these lines on it. We're working towards, this is 32 facets, I believe. And when you're done planing, you're just taking that line off. And those are, those are ink lines. Uh, one more shot. That's the finished product there. You can probably recognize those, some of that joinery from the square post earlier. And now these are these are ready to go. Um, yeah, so te technically, I mean, you'd have to cut those joints in the square timbers perfectly square and true because you're removing, you know, you're removing quantities of those. Correct. Yeah, so, so that they still work, you know, once. once yeah, so you, on. right. You Pretty want, good. when you're at the bottom of your mortise, you want it as square as at the top, you know? Um, so you don't want to be like back cutting and undercutting and stuff because, right, right. yeah. Um, so that was a crazy intense project that we lived through. Um, there's, there's a couple questions, Jeff, that might fit in here. Um, there's some more philosophic questions. Maybe we'll put those off, but, okay. um, how would the timbers be milled in, in the, in, in a traditional technique like full-on traditional I, i'm assuming so uh, yeah i mean so in the 17th century say you know they're they're taking logs they're air drying them for the proper amount of time they're cutting you see these curves right here yeah yeah there's one here one here that's to allow for more even drying and shrinkage so you don't get big face checks on here. Mm -hmm. So cutting a relief curve can allow the thing to, sh and then we wedge them. We keep pounding the wedges in as the thing dries. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we didn't mill these things by hand. 
These were done on large scale machines that join restructures like this here. These are pretty big, not as big as these, but that's big. This is big. Um, and traditionally that stuff would be hewn by hand, starting with huge, really rough ripping saws and stuff. And then um, maybe hewn with um, axes, maybe adzes too, and, and then rough planes and then like super, you know, old school intensive stuff until it became perfect or, you know, more or less perfect um, until it, like, let's say they were doing rounds for a temple and, bef and before the style of architecture that we work in, which I'll talk about briefly in a second, the, all the posts and the residences were round. This used to be just normal for everything. Mm. And so that's pretty intense. So it's very labor intensive for sure to do it full traditional. Uh, Someone's asking about the circular holes. I imagine you're using drills or. We rough those out with like a Forstner bit and then we and then we fit them to our piece oh. with with um, with gouges that have flat bevels. So in canal gouges. Yes, yeah. bevels on the inside. Yeah. 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 How long did it take to make those those round cylindrical posts? If you can, <laughs> if you can see, <laughs> so all I can tell you is that Walter, who's like seventy eight, he said uh, he lost a few years of of his um, life. <laughs> it wasn't years spent; it was years um, <laughs> expended. <laughs> right, right, right. So I think I think you know. Fair enough. When I was doing this, I was also overseeing the project. Right. I don't know how long it took him to do his. It took me a while because I couldn't focus on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but probably, you know, all told, this would be a week of work right here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's not including the big milling, you know, large scale milling. milling right, and stuff. right, right. Um, Here's, so we mentioned some of those early projects coming out of the, um, the Panama Pacific exhibition. And I have a few shots, modern shots, but of some of those projects, um, or at least some of those sites. This one here, this is Hakone Gardens, which was one of the projects that blossomed from the from people seeing what they had done at the Pan Pacific. Uh, I forget the family name. It was, it's not Hakone. Um, they were Americans and they had some property in Saratoga, California, and they liked what they saw at the exhibition. And so they wanted to make something for themselves for their little summer retreat. And this, I don't know actually how old this gate is. The oldest structure on this property dates to like 1918 or something like that. This is a pretty legit gate in terms of its craftsmanship and design. Um, and then this is a little, well, it's actually a pretty large bench um, that we made for them. Um, but I love this gate. This is a really nice gate. Um, needs a little work as you can see, but it's, it, this would be worth restoring, completely restoring, I think. And then another gate, and this is at Golden Gate Park. Um, this is pretty recent actually, but Golden Gate Park is where that exhibition ended up. And there's a big pagoda there that I mentioned. This is a gate with what's called a Chinese gable, Karahafu here, curved, curved gable. And this is really nice. I think this was done in the eighties by a crew from Japan. So, yeah, so that gives you a sense of the type of work that, that we do. We don't do as much of this ornate stuff here. See the, all this like kind of Baroque, these curves and things. This is a little bit more 
fancy. We, we, the stuff we tend to do is a little more restrained Zen style. You can also see some ornate car carving here, barely. Um, but yeah, we, we do do stuff like this. Um, so that, that does bring up the topic that the, the listener um, raised and um, in asking what you know Japanese carpentry is, it's a bit of an arbitrary, you're always making arbitrary exclusions, but excuse me, um, you know, one way to identify it is, is to point to the tools and the techniques, you know? Um, another way would be to point to certain, um, certain works, certain structures, certain products of those tools and techniques like this. Um, and a third way would be to talk about like how Japanese woodworkers and carpenters approach their work. Like this, and that's what I had in mind in talking about the spirit of Japanese carpentry. But let's talk about tools for a second. And then we'll talk a little bit about like works in the Japanese, in Japanese styles. And then, we, and then hopefully we'll spend some time on that last bit about the approach to the work. Um, and I know we're probably gonna run out of time, but um, so I have a bunch of tools behind me. I hope you can see them, okay. You, you wanna, um, unless you're gonna reference your photos again, maybe- you Oh, should, thank you. Should, should put your camera on full, stop screen share. Yep. And... It's just this and that. There you go, perfect. Okay, great, thank you, Jared. <clears throat> so yeah, I brought, I brought some stuff for show and tell. Um, this is one of those round bottom planes from those big nine inch posts. Um, one of the things I immediately was blown away by in terms of the tools when I first went to that job site was how beautiful they are and elegantly simple. At the same time, um, this, I'll try to get in close um, and I'll show some chisels too, but every part of this plane has been thought about aesthetically and functionally. Um, I'll show you another one that's quite, quite fetching, I think. Um, so here's a big 70 millimeter finishing plane. Um, by a guy named Yamamoto-san. And if you, if you can see what's going on in the steel, it's just amazing. He's got this kind of wood grain, what in Japanese would almost be called mokume. Almost, it's kind of Damascus-y, but it's not, it, that's not what it is. Um, I think it's old wrought iron, isn't it? It's not, it's oh. not. Um, it's, although the chip breaker may be, um, this is, this is mainly aesthetic oh. at that point, which by the way, so is most Damascus steel. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a plane. This is a little chamfer plane for putting chamfers on posts and things. Um, show you some chisels. Um, and maybe you could touch on, but the, you know, from my fairly limited experience with Japanese tools, planes, chisels, and my visits to Japan, the manufacturing process is still, is it not just small firms, blacksmiths, they're laminating, they're working with, you know, I wouldn't say primitive technology, but it's not giant machines, you know, laminating large pieces. It's piecework. It's one at a time. It's fascinating. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That, exactly right. These are, these are handmade by blacksmiths. So I don't know if you can see it. Um, if I move this around a bit, you'll see you'll see a, a lamination, yeah, a weld. See, you can see it clear. And so you've got hard steel here, soft steel here, 
which backs the hard steel so it can take blows better. Um, yeah, made, made by blacksmiths in small little shops, kneeling down or, or you know, sitting cross-legged, making these over and over and over and over. <laughs> Um, I, I follow a few guys on Instagram. You, they'll just show a basket full of this, say this size chisel, just the just the blank, you know, after it's been basically forged and some of the grinding done. Um, you can see how how much care goes into these. These aren't. This is done by hand with some power tools, but the basic forging um, and the forge welding takes place by hand with a hammer over like oftentimes with a, um, a charcoal fire. And then you can see the hollows on the back to make it easier to, to, sharp, to flatten the back. These nowadays are typically ground on a grinder, but they used to be done with a sen, which is a, a steel scraper. Yeah, um, some guys still do that. Um, Pull saws, like I mentioned, there's a couple. This one, this is a handmade saw. You can see that, the, you know, the patina on the steel. Um, this was from an old um, antique shop in San Francisco that went out of business and I bought this. This is a little rip saw. Here's a like super fine tooth modern Japanese pull saw. This is made mass produced. Um, the nice thing is it's easily replaced. <laughs> um, so we, we do, we do use a lot of modern stuff as well as the old stuff, including power tools, um, skill saws, stuff like that. Um, these are Japanese squares, Sashigane. This one's in Shaku which is the Japanese base 10 system, but, th but these units are almost about, an, almost it's a little bigger than an inch, which makes it readily um, translatable for us, but it's base 10, which is nice. Um, this is metric, which it was illegal in Japan to make these for a while when they were modernizing. Really? <laughs> you, had to make, you had to make metric. And sometimes we do metric stuff. So there's a metric one. And then the one I use most is Imperial. Um, these are really nice. They're light, lighter than Western ones. That's one of the things about Japanese tools. A lot of them are much lighter and easier to handle than Western ones, especially like comparing this to a giant, you know, Western plane. Um, if you're doing this all day, this is much, if you're planning all day, this is a lot easier on your body. Um, and since the Japanese plane for their finished product, in other words, the final finish isn't sanded or anything, it's, it's plain to like a mirror surface, you, you end up doing a ton of planing. I mean, we do have machines for that too, by the way. Um, I don't know, there's, you know, modern, I don't have any of the traditional marking tools with me. This is those ink lines that I mentioned on that round post are made with this. So you, this is not a chalk line, it's an ink line. And these are super handy. Um, they used, it's called a sumitsubo. They used to be made out of wood and you can still get those and I just didn't bring one. Um, and the, the wooden ones also have an open well here to dip a, a bamboo pen in for, for marking layout with the sashigane. So you'd have a bamboo pen and you'd be using this to mark your lines, dipping it, you know, dipping it in the sumitsubo and, and marking lines. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I don't know. Any questions about the tools? Again, the, I think the tools, both in their functionality and in their aesthetics, they really 
mirror the work being done. They're, yeah. they're fitting for the work being done. And so it's a very unified sensibility, I'd say. Um, how do you care for your body with the physical demands of uh, that type of work? This person's a physical therapist, I guess. It's best just to abuse yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, as I get older, I'm like 52. Um, that's increasingly on my mind. So it's a good reminder. <laughs> and really stretching and yoga and taking time off to recover. You know, I mentioned my friend Walter, who's 77 or however old he is. He wanted, he had never done, he's an amazing craftsman. You rarely get the opportunity to make round posts. And he, so when I asked him to do it, I, I knew he couldn't say no. <laughs> and, and of course he said, yes, um, lucky for me, but he, you know, that took a lot out of him. He, his, you know, people, anyone here working with their hands all the time, you know, you get the tennis elbow that starts to like work its way up into problems up here and all that, you know, it's a systemic situation, systematic situation. So yeah, I, I really need to, um, I mean, that's one of my goals is to take care of my body better with, with stretching and yoga and time off. So it's easier said than done though, isn't it? The work is always pressing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there, there's an interesting book called um, Leisure, the Basis of Culture by, by a Catholic guy named um, Joseph Pieper. And he observes that people really into their, their physical work will tend to sacrifice themselves. Mm. Not because they are altruistic necessarily or whatever but just because the work is mm. it's easy to obsess over mm. um what he doesn't mention is that people involved in intellectual work do the same thing with their with their brains <laughs> right. different kind of stress but um so yeah taking care of yourself is important i need to do it more Oh, I lost you there. Sorry, I had it, had it muted. Oh, okay, um, cool. gotcha. Yeah, ooh, let's see here. Oh, uh, there's a few questions here that I, I kind of I'll, I'll answer just by typing in. There's okay, not too. It'd be slightly off off subject matter wise. <clears throat> yeah, I'm curious about the. The next part of this whole thing you know maybe there maybe we got maybe 15 minutes left okay cool. um and and I'll, I'll i'll prod you with the first one of the first questions um yeah. let's see here on the topic of zen training versus woodworking um i read years ago that the japanese look at woodworking as a meditation um that is what sp sparked my interest uh, maybe oh. you can speak about that right so a little yeah. segue into the next a, a perfect segue yeah thank thanks for whoever um put that out there and, and thanks for picking it up jared um yeah so we did look at you know some of those so buildings and projects and stuff and i won't say too much about identifying japanese carpentry and we're working in terms of style but most of that most of the stuff we do happens to be in what's called showing or skiosh showing style. It's roughly 14th to 17th centuries. It's it's kind of the the less ornate, more shakery, if you will, style that you you find in Japan that came came up through the influence of Zen and tea, which is a very Zen practice historically as well as in terms of what it's about. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was what, what the listener asked about, which was um, has to do with the, the way Japanese woodworkers approach their work. Obviously, I'm going to do some generalizing here, 
Um, not every Japanese carpenter has anything to do with with some with the stuff I'm going to talk about, whether it's Zen or Shinto. But Zen and Shinto really form a cultural background and the soil out of which Japanese carpentry grows. And I think without understanding that, you can't really understand the practice of, of Japanese woodworking. I'm, I'm neither an adherent of Shinto nor a Zen practitioner myself, um, but I recognize what, what the stuff um, I do every day has, um, what it owes to those traditions, let's put it that way. So, so yeah, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, you know, not a lot of people outside of Japan know what Shinto is. Shinto is widely characterized as kind of the national Japanese religion. It's basically, it's an animistic religion. And I, I'm using the word religion in scare quotes. Um, we're not gonna try to define religion today. <laughs> if we did, we'd be here a long time. Um, but it's, it's, you know, Shinto is basically the, what the translation would be is the way of the gods. And there's a nice phrase, I think, that sums up the Shinto sensibility, which is gods in everything. Um, you, you could talk about sort of presences in everything. You could talk about the sacred in everything. Um, shin can also be translated as heart or core um, and do is like Tao, the way, way of gods, way of, way of hearts, way of gods. If, if I ever develop this talk a little more, I might, instead of calling it like the spirit of Japanese carpentry, I might call it the spirits of Japanese carpentry. So these, these presences or these spirits, um, anima in Latin, in Shinto are sort of, um, they're presences to be honored in all things. A lot of times it has, you know, very much to do with place. And so you see Tori gates all over Japan, even in the forest and so forth. The Tori gate marks off a sacred area a sacred place, a place of kami or, or gods. And since gods for most Westerners has a lot of connotations that I would wanna uh, warn against here, I'll just call them kami. So kami are these presences or spirits. And when I look at both tea ceremony and, and carpentry and flower arrangement and all these things in Japan, the care and kind of almost ritual nature of the proceeding, I recognize immediately as getting like bordering on a sense of the sacred. Um, that's the only way I can really describe it. Um, and, and I think people who have looked closely at tea ceremony, um, flower arrangement, even some of the, um, they still do Shinto ceremonies to, to um, like begin a building project, right? Um, but even watching a carpenter who's really good, it's, there's something um, so intentional and so respectful and attentive about the way they go about their business. You can see the influence, I think, of this Shinto culture of reverence for the, the spirit of place, the spirit of a material, the spirit of a process. And there's a, there's a real, I, don't, I wouldn't call it uptight and I wouldn't call it any, it has nothing to do with placating angry deities or anything. It's, it's even joyful at times. Um, it's, it's about observing uh, all these words sound negative to us. Uh, it's hard to characterize. Observing limits, observing boundaries, observing processes, 
uh, that are that are out there apart from us. Um, so it, a lot of times it borders on a kind of um, what what to Western eyes might look like nature worship, but isn't because worship isn't the right term. Um, again, we tend to theologize from the West and, and impose impose a character where it doesn't belong. But um, so so Shinto has a lot to do with the kind of reverent approach to materials, respect for materials, respect for the way steel works, reverence for steel. I mean, when I look at this, I see a deep reverence for, for technique and for steel and for how, how things go, the way of things, you know? So um, there's an interesting story that Paul Disco tells when he was, first working down at Tassajara and, and um, Suzuki Roshi had, they were doing some demo work and they were taking shingles off an old building. And Suzuki Roshi had them take the shingles off and then stack them carefully, meticulously, and, and then um, tie string around them very neatly and everything. And I think Paul thought that, oh, we're going to use these later. So he wants them nice and neat. And then they put them in a pile and burned them. And that, that kind of illustrates this notion of like respect. And again, I don't want to say thankfulness, but something like that. Um, so this reverence and attention and even wonder, uh, you know, the Greeks talked about wonder as the beginning of philosophy and, and wonder in Homer is, is at the root of craft and it's, it's the result of craft. And I think that's, a, that's probably a better um, cultural touchstone for us than some of the Christian stuff that we might tend to put on this, so. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, that's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a good way of, I, I really appreciate your, your perspective and words on, you know, have, having traveled there, you know, it's, 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 it's really hard to see outside of our perspective as Westerners or, you know, but even the, my, my story, if I, if I may, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the food is displayed very carefully and thoughtfully and respectfully reverence, you know, whatever word you want to try to find for it, even in the equivalent of like a, what I would say a truck stop diner, you know, over there, you know, some old lady brings it out very carefully and, you know, where, you know, other parts of the world that would just been tossed on the tray and thrown in front of you, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing, you know? Yeah. It's, Going there, I was um, astounded at, you can peel back the layers in Japan and continue to find that, <clears throat> you know. You can look at very humble objects and it's not like the place is a perfect wonderland, it's not. It's got a very dark side, like, we, like all cultures do. True, true. Um, but you can, you can, wander around Kyoto for days just discovering new layers of sensitivity and attention, you know? Um, and it's, it's very moving to me, very moving. So, um, but, you know, in addition to the Shinto, there's obviously the Zen background. And for those who don't know, Zen and Shinto in Japan, though they've at times, depending on the political situation, one has had sort of the upper hand. Sometimes they struggle together. Essentially in the minds of most Japanese, they're just two aspects of the same thing. Um, Shinto and, and Zen in Japan go very much together. There's really not a lot of discord. It's not like uh, some of the unfortunate religious situations we see elsewhere. Um, even though Zen was brought from India essentially, um, through Korea to Japan in a situation where there was already a kind of um, indigenous religion, they still have got along, gotten along pretty amazingly. And um, 
they're not seen as at odds with each other. And of course, the Zen practice, which, which, which the listener brought up, um, I think that has a ton to do with the approach to the work as well. Um, specifically, um, the teaching about the place of words versus practice itself, doing. Um, Zen practice tends to emphasize getting to a place in your consciousness that is wordless and without concepts. Um, you know, various names for it in Japan, um, Mushan, Munan, these terms, no mind, no thought. It's not about being unaware, you know, obviously. It's, a, it's about being aware in a way that's more direct. And so the emphasis on wordless practice, a lot of Japanese carpentry teachers who are traditional and raised in that milieu will, the words are at a minimum. You, you're there to observe, <laughs> you know, and they will encourage you just sort of like in, in some of the, the Japanese sword manuals, not to, not to get stuck in concepts and words, but simply to do and to do until you do it effortlessly and perfectly. Um, so the wordless practice from Zen is, is a huge part of what I think makes these carpenters so good. And egoless practice, the, the, the encouragement to get yourself out of the way and to put aside um, fear and, and other things based in desire, you know, or uh, you, you hit some of these problems that Zen teachers hit in trying to describe this stuff. It's not that you don't have desires, it's that they're not overweening and in control. It's not that you're trying to do nothing. <laughs> you're trying to do something, but you're trying to also let it come through you. So there's a certain kind of Wu Wei, almost Taoist um, influence with Zen. Um, and so this wordless and egoless practice, A, it, it leads to quicker competency and eventually mastery. Um, and B, it, the, it's, it goes hand in hand with that Shinto sort of loving attention because it's about letting the work itself come forth rather than trying to express yourself or trying to control a situation. Obviously there's, we're talking about a lot of control here. <laughs> if you look at those temples, there's some matter coming under human control, right? Um, and yet the attitude, the approach, the posture that those carpenters take to it is it's not about um, boosting their ego or any of that stuff. They see themselves as part of a tradition and they are, they're trying to get into that stream rather than divert the stream into their own channel, right? Um, so, so these are things that I think really influence the, the satisfaction in the work itself. There's the kind of hedonic paradox or the egoistic paradox. If you're, if you're seeking to inflate yourself, you're gonna find yourself constantly more and more disappointed. Or if you're just seeking pleasure, you're gonna find that you get less and less of it. The offspring of not seeking that stuff and really having a loving attention to the work itself and to the materials in the Japanese scene is that it is very satisfying. And the product is amazing. Um, so there's these, there are these kind of like Zen and the art of archery paradoxes. If you're obsessed with hitting the target and you're full of chatter about hold your hand this way, pull the elbow up three degrees to the right, you're not doing it yet. You know, it's when you can give that stuff up. And through doing your 10,000 or 30,000 hours, the body knows what to do. That's much more in keeping with these uh, kind of Zen and Shinto ways of approaching things. Your uh, philosophy uh, world is shining through now, Jeff. It's, it's, <laughs> well, it's great. It's great. Really refreshing okay. and nice. Uh, 
nice, nice stuff to think about. Thanks. Yeah. When, when tied to working with the hands, you know, and, and yeah. all of that, yeah, like you said, yeah. uh, matter is being shaped. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of who we are, right? So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Be a part of it. Absolutely. So yeah, maybe, you know, maybe there are questions, maybe not, um, but I'm happy to chat. Yeah, I think we should try to wind down, but there's just a couple here. Um, uh, practice is, do you know of any practitioners of the Japanese tradition style who are building specifically Christian religious structures? That's a great question. Um, offhand, no. I do know a few Japanese, meaning woodworkers in the tradition, Japanese woodworkers in that sense, who are Christian of one stripe or another. Um, but I don't think I know anyone doing churches say i i did see some christian churches in japan that were in a japanese style mm -hmm. for sure but not that many they're, they're there they're there what about um what's the best example of japanese carpentry in the states if there is uh, just one i mean and i don't know they're not framing it if there's something that they can see or you know public public or or private mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's not disclosed. There's, there's a really, from what I understand, and I have yet to go, I have actually plans to go this spring. In Philly, uh, there's, there's a place called Shofuso. Hmm. Shofuso has a building that was more or less modeled on a Japanese building that's got an amazing um, special roof. R roofs are... A big part of Japanese. If we were, if we talked more about Japanese structures and styles and what makes the building Japanese, we would talk a lot about roofs. Um, the roof is critical and um, characteristic, but this roof is special, and it's got um, it's got a this building has a great reputation as one of the best examples of authentic Japanese architecture in America, in the U.S. In, in, in Philadelphia, but is it a, a part of a, a, a botanical garden or a, what, what? It's a Japanese garden, which is, as far as I know, not part of some larger okay. Western garden, you know, okay. unlike like some, Waddell Reserve or, you know, places uh, like that. Yeah, yeah someone, put it, someone uh, put it in the chat for everybody. If you want to go look, there's a link. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Cameron. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, what about George Nakashima? Yeah, I mean, here you, you have someone straddling a few traditions, you know, in a very cool way. You know, he's got Windsory elements in his chairs and then he's got the live edge thing going, which is a very Zen kind of tea uh, conceit, if you will, or feature. Um, so he, he's a special case, really. He's like a hybrid, you know, mm. uh, and, I, and I, to be honest, I don't know enough about his biography, um, but looking at his work and, and some of his books and things, the soul of a tree and, and that stuff. Um, yeah, you can definitely see a deep Japanese influence in his work but he's not trying to produce Japanese stuff, I wouldn't say, it's not, not exclusively. Right, right. Uh, here's the interesting question, and maybe, uh, maybe we'll, 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 we'll shut her down after this, but uh, th this, this uh, comment, there seems to be a lot of waste in Japanese timber framing technique of the wood needing to be so pristine. How is that reverent to the forest? And I, I'm trying to, yeah, anyway, that's, that's the question. Oh, I, I'm not sure where, where they think the waste comes in specifically. 
Yeah, that's kind of what what I was. I, I wonder if it's it's just uh, mm, yeah, cutting away these these ancient trees to make a temple. But I wouldn't. I would. I don't know. Uh, you know, something like that where yeah, killing trees to make these temples. I don't well, know. Yeah. I'm interjecting on this now, trying to understand what they're getting at. But yeah, yeah. I mean, if they if they want to um, chime in some more, I'd be happy to yeah. try to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean. This is sort of a Princess Mononoke situation. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, you know, especially given the situation we're in now uh, with, with climate change and all that, um, it's an important question. Like, what do we want to use this wood for um, if we use it at all, you know? And, you know, Heidegger has written about the modern world picture and seeing nature as some kind of like storehouse for our purposes and all that stuff is critical part of the conversation. So I welcome the question. I just right. was curious to hear more. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's I threw it in there because it was you know of that vein, right? Opens up a bigger can of worms, but uh, yeah. Yeah. maybe nothing we can uh, comment to here. <laughs> right. Um. Just gonna look through real quick. Um, maybe Sarah can chime in. Is this is gonna be available later uh, on the YouTube or through, uh, is North House keeping this? Yeah, we will have a recording of this presentation on northhouse.org uh, in our crafting in place uh, section of the website. So um, we'll uh, probably have it up in maybe early next week or mid next week, I should say, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. And can, can I address that question just a little bit more? Yeah. For two seconds. Um, again, there's a question of whether we should be using trees for these kinds of structures at all. But I would say that traditionally, the practice of Japanese carpenters and their use of materials, every bit of the tree sort of gets used. <laughs> I mean, from the bark for shingles to um, even using like trees that would be considered not good timber right. for those for those big crooked members in the roof. Um, you know, wood is, is treated as quite valuable. Now, whether we should treat it as a means again versus an end in itself, that's too big a question for today. But it's, again, I, I love that question and um, it's worth talking about sometime. Cool. Yeah, there, there's a few other questions. You know, Tokyo tool makers. I don't know if you you know anybody off, off the top of your head. I'm I'm not that deep into Japan. Um, most of the tool makers that I know of are in the Osaka um, area or greater Osaka area, but not Tokyo so much. And usually how it is too, the tool makers usually use a merchant to pedal their pedal mm -hmm. their wares too. It, it'd be nearly impossible to, to probably go directly to a tool maker. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming yeah. from what I understand. Right. Yeah. If you're yeah. if you're talking directly to a tool maker, it's because you've had an inside right. introduction from someone that person trusts and right. all of that. Yeah. And I know that there's a bunch of different, you know, tool merchants around. Japan, Tokyo too. So, um, Patty, you can. Yeah. How you, if you're traveling around Japan, you you can you can find that information. I think. Yeah, and you could even start by looking on Instagram. Right. Um, and there, you know, there are some in the, like I said, the Osaka area, um, Nobori, Ryota, and then I don't know where Kurashi Day, Kurashi. I never say their name right. Um, you know, I can give out my email too if people have questions like that and I can answer them, I'll send you something. Yep, that was the, kind of the next kind of final thing is, you know, you have a website, you, you've you written a bunch, you know, blog in the past. Oh, that's um, right. You know, uh, if people want to get a hold of you. Um, okay. What's the best way if you're if you're open to that? I know you just mentioned that already. Um, yeah. Like, um, Actually, a, a good way to get either to get in touch with me or to see more or whatever um, 
it's kind of a it connects to all aspects of my online <laughs> life whatever is uh instagram my account is three sticks design numeral three sticks design and um you can you can find other stuff through that i don't really have a website okay i just use instagram right right but the blog that you mentioned, Jared, is connected there too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever online, you know, there's so many different angles right. one, one can choose. Um, maybe last question, because this is going to be good for, for folks interested. Uh, resource on how to learn how to set up Japanese planes, tools. Oh, that's a great question and a good uh, reminder. Yeah, um, I, I work with a nonprofit called Kazurokai USA. And I think Sarah was gonna share, there it is. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we are a nonprofit whose sole you know, purpose is to educate people about Japanese woodworking. So Jared did a presentation last weekend, I believe. Yep. 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 Uh, on Japanese turning and Urushi, Jared and Jasmine. Um, and we, we have, at that website, you'll find online classes. And we're happy to be announcing these days that we're gonna have a live event in 2022, which is something we used to do every year. That's typically here in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And, uh, but we sometimes do sort of satellite meetings as well. Uh, but check out the Kazurakai US website and you'll see some little classes you can take on how to set up a chisel or a plane or other things. I think I've got a chisel class there. Um, other guys who are probably better teachers than, than I am have stuff. Just check it out, dig, dig through that and you'll, you'll find something. Yeah, great, great for sharing that. I think it's a, a great resource for folks. Yeah, cool, thank you. Well, maybe we should, uh say goodbye it's really informative i'm getting lots of comments in the chat people are really happy and cool. uh, thank you fantastic you. presentation yeah thanks jeff all right yeah, thank, thank you. you so much jeff and thank you thanks, to you as well jared we really appreciate you both being here tonight and thank you to everybody who tuned in it yes was, uh, wonderful yeah. yeah thank you Okay, well, everybody have a fantastic evening. And if you are in Grand Marais, come on down to the campus. <laughs> We've got one more thing going on this evening, Mary Mae's presentation at seven. So, but thanks again, Jeff and Jared. Yeah, thank and you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay, take care. Good night. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Okay.